Okay, good evening and welcome everyone. Glad to see you're all with us tonight. Uh, welcome to, this is the uh, virtual public input session, session two. I'm sorry, I forgot to change my slide of the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan implementation. So today is December, December 18th, and this is the second of two virtual sessions that we're hosting. The other one was hosted last Thursday evening. Uh, we've got about 49 people right, logged in right now, and it's steadily climbing because I know we have many more registered, so I'm sure we'll see many more pop on. Uh, my name is Jim Ostrowski, and I'm with the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, or EGLE. I work in our Environmental Support Division. I'm going to be helping to moderate today's session. So I'm just going to run through a couple logistics for this evening. First of all, all lines are muted. Um, we will open the lines up individually for you when it's time to make comments. So I'll explain how to do that when we get to that point. We are also recording this meeting just like we do all sessions, virtual sessions, we record them and we post them to our YouTube channel. So for some reason you have to leave early or maybe you want to go back and watch Thursday's session, uh, that's up on our YouTube channel. You can find it there. Also, make sure you keep an eye on the chat because we'll be posting a couple things in the chat today. Um, so keep an eye on that. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn over to our director, Phil Roos. So Phil Roos, Eagle Director, coming up. Thanks, Jim. Uh, welcome, everybody. I wish I could see you or we're with you in person, but I'm, I'm really glad you're part of this. Thank you for participating in this public input session. This, as Jim said, this is focused on the implementation of the My Healthy Climate Plan. Uh, as Jim said, I'm uh, director of Michigan Environment of Great Lakes and Energy, or we like to call it EGLE. Our mission is to protect Michigan's air, land, water, and the public health that uh, uh, depends upon that. And we're doing some exciting things at EGLE. I'm not here to talk much about that, but it, it, it's relevant to what we're talking about in relation to the climate plan. We've set a vision uh, to be an enduring national leader in environmental protection. Um, that means taking all of the work we do around uh, regulation of air, land, and water, and other, uh, other items. And we're going to continue to try to push the envelope uh, and have, we already have the strongest in the nation lead and copper rule to protect drinking water, take that to the next level. Uh, we have a robust air toxics program that exceeds national standards, continue to move that forward. And uh, we're a leader in identifying and addressing PFAS sites, uh, addressing contaminated sites, and so much more. Uh, now, the way this fits in is that uh, we're adding, uh, well, it's been part of Eagle's uh, repertoire here for the last several years since uh, this became Eagle in, I think, the year 2021. Uh, but now we're truly adding climate to our leadership portfolio. Uh, we're responsible through the Office of Climate and Energy, which is housed within EGLE, for driving statewide implementation of the My Healthy Climate Plan. And I think we all know that climate work impacts almost every aspect of uh, people's lives here, uh, whether everybody appreciates that now or not. And it also affects all of our work at EGLE. We're going to embed it in all of our water resources uh, work and uh, in our air uh, protection regulation program and the way we manage uh, hazardous materials or other materials, uh, the way we clean up contaminated sites, all of that, we're gonna bring climate into that. Uh, so it's not just a plan that we implement externally, but it's one that we're gonna really drive home within all of Eagle and across state government. But ultimately this is about impacting the lives of Michiganders in a positive way. Uh, the, the fact that we can reduce air pollution, air emissions, uh, climate, carbon emissions, uh, that's gonna come from clean energy. That's gonna benefit everybody. We're gonna have cleaner waters with fewer pollutants and we're gonna have an economy that'll be transformed and uh, proofed and ready for the future, uh, a an economy that embraces these burgeoning clean energy industries. So it's really exciting and it's really important. And there's a big commitment from our agency and all of state government to help make this happen for all of our 10 million Michiganders. This, we're at a really important moment uh, in terms of climate action. Uh, we have an unprecedented level of federal funding to support some of these efforts to really do that important jump starting of our efforts. Uh, in transforming the economy and getting us uh, decarbonized. 
We have, I hope uh, you guys are aware of and excited about the new climate legislation that was signed recently. Uh, there were five different bills, 100% uh, uh, clean energy by 2040. That's a pretty amazing. Um, uh, we are reforming the way that uh, our uh, Michigan Public Service Commission regulates utilities to ensure that they're also uh, uh, embedding assessment of climate as well as justice in their decisions uh, that they, when they're working with utilities on their future plans. Uh, we also have a siting reform for the way that we uh, site renewable energies like uh, solar and wind. Uh, we have a new office of just transition to make sure that we do this in a just way and that nobody's left behind. Uh, there could be people displaced from certain industries. We want to minimize that and uh, create opportunities for them within the clean energy sector. Um, and then finally, we have dramatically increased our energy efficiency standards. So those are five different bills big, big potential impact. They're really truly that we talked about national leader earlier, but these would be in the top uh, five or so states in the country. Uh, so Michigan is really now established as a leader. We just have to make it all happen and do the implementation. We've also had a lot of executive leadership from our governor, Governor Whitmer, uh, committing us to carbon neutrality in the first place, commissioning the development of the Michigan Climate, Healthy Climate Plan that we're gonna talk about today. And then before any of this federal money came in, dedicating more than a billion dollars in funding in this year's budget to the implementation of this plan. So we have some resources and we have real commitment to put this forward. Um, why this event is important is that we have to capture that momentum and we, we know time is of the essence. Uh, so what we're gonna do now is focus on the actual implementation of the plan and all of its elements. And to do so, we're having sessions like this, as Jim said, this is the second of the virtual sessions, but we've also had a number of in-person sessions around the state and we're gathering additional input and ideas on how best to meet the goals and commitments of the My Healthy Climate Plan through all of EGLE's programs and across state government and across really our economy. Uh, and specifically through the climate produce, produ uh, we're gonna look to how best to uh, have an impact through the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program, which uh, we're gonna, you're gonna hear more about this in a minute, but it's an unprecedented $5 billion in federal grants from the US EPA that has the potential to fund implementation projects and programs across Michigan. This is big stuff. We're in a really important moment. We all know about the urgency of this moment. Um, if not now, then when? Uh, and clearly now is the time. Thank you for being here. We need your input. We need your ideas. We need your passion. And we need your heart in this. Uh, so thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of this important journey with us. Uh, the world depends on us all. Uh, so we appreciate it and I appreciate that you're here. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Phil, for being with us tonight. You bet. Thanks. Everybody. All right, everybody. Um, now we're going to move on and I'm going to introduce Corey Conley. And oh, there you are, Corey. <laughs> you can just go ahead and share your screen when you're ready. And while you're doing that, just want to remind those people that might have logged in a little bit late. Uh, this is the virtual the virtual public input session number two that we're doing. Um, we'll be taking your comments in just a little while. But right now, I'm turning it over to Corey for an introductory presentation. I see your presentation's up and ready to go, Corey. You can unmute and go. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Director Roos, for um, for being here and for the for the introduction. Um, as as Jim mentioned, um, my name is Corey Conley. I lead the Office of Climate and Energy here at Eagle, um, and our main task is developing and implementing the My Healthy Climate Plan. Um, I've got a few slides, but I'll just say, kind of on the front end, that something we say oftentimes at our office, and as we we said while we were working on the climate plan, is that. You know, we work to set goals based on what humanity and the planet needs, and then it's our job to, job to figure out how we get there and how to make those goals a reality or make them possible. Um, and I think we're at an exciting moment here as um, the director uh, narrated for you. Um, we've got some pretty incredible resources and opportunities here, and we're really turning toward um, really implementation and really excited to come back and, and get additional input on how to implement here today and as we have across the state over the last couple of weeks here. 
Um, so what you can expect um, from here today, uh, we've gotten through most of the welcome. I'm gonna go over a few of the objectives and kind of why we're doing these sessions, a little bit about the My Healthy Climate Plan. And then the main show is for us to hear from you all. And, and I'm really excited about that. So I'm gonna try not to talk too much, um, though I am, uh, I do talk a lot. So uh, I'll, no promises. Um, so our objectives for this session, uh, the first is, you know, we want to make sure that folks understand the My Healthy Climate Plan, some of the goals and, and commitments that we've made it across the state of Michigan, um, and some of the activities that we're doing to undertake um, and implement the, those goals. Uh, and then the, the bulk of this, though, is a time to provide input. And we really want to hear from you all on top climate action priorities in your community, really with it turning toward implement implementation. So thinking about how do we how do we actually implement the various goals and objectives in the My Healthy Climate Plan? I'll go through a few of those in a second. What are the major barriers that you're facing in your community or that you anticipate facing in your community or, or line of work as it relates to implementing the commitments in the My Healthy Climate Plan? Uh, and then what environmental justice considerations should we be considering as we move into implementation um, and really start to roll out some of these programs and, and really uh, see the climate plan in action. So the My Healthy Climate Plan, uh, the director mentioned a bit about it, but it is the, the, the kind of roadmap, so to speak, to the governor's commitments around climate. So Governor Whitmer committed to reaching carbon neutrality by 2050 um, and net negative emissions thereafter, as well as reducing emissions by 50 to 52% by 2030 uh, and doing so in a just and equi equitable manner. The My Healthy Climate Plan is uh, our strategy for getting there. Um, it is a, a document with many pages and many commitments, but um, I'm gonna go over some of the major ones. Uh, and it's always been meant to be iterative. And so we're we're really looking to, to dive deeper as we go uh, for implementation. So quite obviously, the My Healthy Climate Plan is, is targeting reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That's pretty straightforward. But we also see uh, climate action as an opportunity to address environmental injustices, uh, improve health outcomes in communities all over Michigan, uh, and create jobs and reduce costs. And we really tried to, we try to keep that center as a part of the framing for how we're approaching climate action in the state of Michigan and also try and center it in the solutions and, and hopefully folks here today can help us come up with some of those solutions. So what does the My Healthy Climate Plan do? What's included in it? Um, it's organized in six pillars. Uh, for folks that have been in our in-person sessions, of which I think there are a few, you'll know these pillars well by now, um, but six pillars, a commitment to environmental justice being the first one, cleaning the electric grid, electrifying vehicles, and increasing public transit, repairing and decarbonizing homes and businesses, driving clean innovation and industry, and protecting Michigan's land and water. Um, each of those uh, pillars have major overarching commitments. So in the in the environmental justice and a just transition pillar, that's committing to make sure that 40% of benefits from climate and energy related funding, climate related funding um, at the state and federal level, uh, that the benefits from that funding goes to disadvantaged communities. Um, the clean the electric grid is reaching 60% renewables by 2030 uh, and, and even higher penetrations thereafter. Uh, 2 million electric vehicles on the road via charging infrastructure investments um, and driving increased purchase of vehicles and driving an increase in public transportation um, over that same period of time. Uh, repairing and decarbonizing homes, that is really, you know, reducing emissions by 17% in buildings. That comes out to something close to 2 million buildings need, needing to be retrofitted by 2030. Uh, driving clean energy and clean innovation in industry covers a whole swath of things, but a 45% recycling rate and cutting food waste in half by 2030 are two of the big ticket items. Um, and then protecting 30% of land and water uh, by 2030. And there's a whole variety of other um, goals underneath a bunch of these um, that really help kind of bundle up to the broader uh, decarbonization goals and the broader uh, kind of North Star goals in each pillar of the climate plan. So 
the opportunity that the director Roos referenced earlier, the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program, is a $5 billion program available nationwide. Uh, it's broken out into two phases. One is a planning grant phase. Um, that's the phase we're in currently. And then the second one is an implementation grant phase. So during the planning grant phase, organization it, governments across the country received planning grants. The state of Michigan received a planning grant for statewide planning. Um, the Southeast Council of uh, Southeast Michigan Council of Governments. Um, anybody who has a dog will appreciate that my dog is currently chewing a bone very loudly. And so I apologize if that's somehow distracting from anyone else. Hopefully it's only distracting to me. Um, but uh, back to back to the climate pollution reduction grant. Uh, the planning grant program, um, the Grand Valley Metro Council also received a planning grant for the Grand Rapids Metro region. If you're participating in any of the planning process for either of those uh, planning grants, um, we are syncing up with those entities. Uh, we're we're additionally getting input all over the state as a part of the planning process, as Director Roos mentioned, and we have this virtual session here tonight to get some of that input. Um, we're digging in deeper into a greenhouse gas inventory to really ground the priority actions that need to be in, invested in um, and in ground our planning in greenhouse gas emissions uh, reductions. And then we're building from uh, months and months and months and years of work uh, informed by uh, input through the My Healthy Climate Plan development process and the work group process, um, informed by uh, the UP Energy Task Force, informed by input from local governments through our Catalyst, Leader, Catalyst Communities Program and a variety of other input opportunities. So. For the planning phase, we're in this process right now. We're gathering all this input, uh, and then we will put out a. We're we're tasked with putting out a priority climate action plan um, that will then guide folks uh, and local governments, tribal governments, and and others in the state as it relates to the second phase of the climate pollution reduction grant program, which is the implementation grant program. So, in order for an implementation grant to be considered as a part of the competition, it must be pursuant to one or more priority climate action plans. So we're developing that priority climate action plan. We will release uh, draft measures on that in the new year and anticipate getting additional feedback as we go. Um, and, and that should help uh, guide um, what the actual implementation grant process looks like. So additional opportunities for input here, just to uh, make sure folks uh, understand all the different ways to participate. So we have the in-person engagement sessions that we just completed. Really appreciate everybody who attended and participated in those. Um, we are currently in our second of two virtual input sessions and you can see the kind of virtual engagements there. Um, I'm not quite, I have something weird going off my screen but I hope everybody else can see it okay. Um, and then we have a call for projects open right now. So it is a call for projects um, that we are looking for to help inform the priority climate action plan development and really hope that folks can really fill those in and send it in. Um, those are going to be really helpful for us as we as we continue to develop out the priority climate action plan. Um, and the deadline for that is uh, this week on the 20th. So you still have a little bit of time. Um, so that's all of everything that we're doing. We're gathering input, we're taking previous uh, efforts into account, we're deepening the the actual science-based um, information that helps drive the, the planning process here. And then we're gonna take that input, develop a priority climate action plan, but that's not where it ends. So the priority climate action plan will drive the climate pollution action grant implementation grant program. Um, an opportunity, but it'll also help us with other opportunities. We have, um, currently we have a, a request for information for a, how to how to best leverage financing for um, clean energy goals in Michigan. Uh, this input will help inform that program. We have uh, My Healthy Climate Corps program that we're launching currently. This input will help inform that program. Um, we have 
in the future new state funding opportunities that we're trying to design specifically with the input that we're getting from the session today and other sessions over the last couple of weeks. Um, and there are a whole variety of other input opportunities um, and ways in which we're going to take this input, put it into the Priority Climate Action Plan, and also incorporate it into a broader comprehensive strategy for implementing the My Healthy Climate Plan now and for the next few years. Um, so that is that is kind of why we're here today in the main framework um, and a little bit of background on kind of where, where we've been, what we're doing now, and where we're going to go uh, with the information that we get. So with that, I will go ahead and hand it back to Jim um, to uh, dig into the actual meat of the of the evening. All right, thanks Corey for that presentation. And um, just to let everybody know, we gave the same presentation on Thursday and we're running this meeting just like we did on Thursday. Uh, so it's just a, a, a redo of the other one. That's an, another one for those that couldn't make the Thursday session. So now we're going to move into the public input part of the night, and this is where Corey and the team go into listening mode. So what we're going to do is listen to you and your comments, and hopefully you saw in the chat, uh, Jennifer Acevedo was here with us. Um, she's going to be putting some stuff in the chat for us, um, and also she'll be putting in who's on deck to um to, to, to comment, because uh, what I want you to do is if you have a comment that you want to make tonight, you can um, raise your hand, click the raise hand icon, and that's going to tell me that you want to speak. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to call your name and we will unmute you then. And you'll see uh, uh, something come up on your screen. You'll see a little microphone that you can then unmute and then you can make your comment. Uh, when you make your comment, if you would, please uh state your name and any organization you're with and please keep it to three minutes we've got a lot of people on tonight about 70 people a lot of you i know want to make comments so we want to get through these as best we can as efficiently as we can so keep it to three minutes uh at about you'll see a little clock come up and that clock's going to give you your three minute countdown up in the corner uh, small in the corner uh, when you have one minute left i'm going to ring my little bell here and hopefully it'll work so you can hear it well, maybe it won't. I knew this wouldn't work. Well, if I can get to work, you'll hear a little bell ding, and that means you've got one minute left. And um, if you have comments that are going to go a little longer, or if you have additional things you want to say, make additional comments after you're done tonight, or maybe you don't feel like being um, – make a comment verbally. You don't want to do that. So if you don't want to do that, you can. that's perfectly fine. You can just email us at eagle, E-G-L-E, dash O-C-E, at michigan.gov. The comments you submit in writing hold just as much as weight as any comments that you're going to verbalize tonight. So either or is fine with us. Um, I'm just going to check to see if we have anybody on the phone. It looks like we don't. Oh, it looks like we might have a couple people on the phone. If we have somebody on the phone and you want to make a comment, all you do is hit pound two on your phone. Again, if you're just on the phone listening in, you hit pound two on your phone. That'll raise your hand. Let us know that you want to make a comment and I will call you by your phone number. All right, I think that's all my comments. Uh, Corey, we had a couple of people list, listing with you. Do you wanna introduce them or have them introduce themselves? Yeah, I'd love to have everyone from our team introduce themselves. Um, but again, I'll just say Corey Connolly, Office of Climate and Energy, and then I can go ahead and hand it to Jordan and Sarah in that order. Hi everyone, I'm Jordan. I'm also in the Office of Climate and Energy. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah. I use she or they pronouns, fine with either, and I'm the Climate Data Science Officer within the Office of Climate and Energy. So really excited to be here and to hear everyone's comments. And I'll hand it back to you, Jim. All right. Thanks, team. Like I said, uh, teams are going to be in listing mode. So are not going to answer any questions. They're just here to listen to you, take notes, do what they need to do to hear your input. That's why you were here tonight. Okay. So if you look at the chat, you should see, I'm just checking to make sure. Yep. Jennifer put in who is on deck to speak first. So check out the chat and you can see if you're ready. You won't get to be able to unmute though until I tell you. So don't don't worry about that until you're up. So the first person we have up is uh, Mike Berkowitz. So Mike, I'm going to unmute, let you unmute your line and just remind you to say your name and any organization you're with and you'll have five minutes or excuse me, three minutes to go. 
Great, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Mike Berkowitz. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the Associate Director of Policy for Michigan at an organization called Elevate. Elevate is a nonprofit uh, that designs and implements programs to ensure everybody has clean and affordable heat, power, and water in their homes and communities, no matter who they are or where they live. We administer a variety of energy efficiency, solar, battery, storage, workforce development, clean water programs, you name it. We focus on multifamily housing, nonprofit and institutional buildings in underserved communities across the Midwest and Pacific Northwest. We built resilience centers, run clean energy job training accelerators and help decarbonize and deliver clean water for hundreds of thousands of housing units, including many in Detroit, Flint, Ann Arbor, Grand Rapids, Muskegon and more. One of the pillars of the My Healthy Climate Plan is reducing heating related emissions 17% by 2030. The, clean, the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant, the CPRG, is a critical tool to help meet this goal. Elevate specifically recommends that EGLE use the CPRG funding for building electrification and to address whole home decarbonization retrofits for nonprofit facilities, specifically in underserved communities. Nonprofits like churches, pantries, shelters, and community centers don't have a lot of other Inflation Reduction Act incentives or opportunities for funding to address their buildings. But from experience, Elevate has found they are often some of the most well-equipped and economic retrofit projects out there. Many nonprofits provide key community resources and services, so decarbonizing their buildings and making them more resilient creates long-lasting non-energy benefits for those nonprofits, as well as the community members who depend on them. Eagle should put extra attention on funding electrification and whole home building decarbonization retrofits for nonprofit buildings in Michigan's most underserved communities. Thank you again for taking our comments into consideration. My name is Mike Berkowitz, and I was speaking on behalf of Elevate. All right, thanks, Mike. And just for everyone, everyone follow, following up, uh, <clears throat> that's just how you want to make your comments. <laughs> Say your name and who you're with and three minutes. Okay, so you can see who's up next is Sally Petrella. Sally, <clears throat> I have a muted your line. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Sally Petrella, and I'm the watershed ecologist for Friends of the Rouge, uh, which is a nonprofit organization focused on the Rouge River in Southeast Michigan. I've been engaging community members and collecting data about the health of the watershed for over 20 years as we work to clean up and restore the Rouge River and guide its recovery from over 100 years of pollution and abuse. Um, the top climate action priority for our community are to address climate change's impact on water quality, especially in our underserved and overburdened communities. We're already seeing the impact on the watershed from these intense storm events, and we need to collaborate on how best to protect the resource. Um, I actually was surprised by the lack of water in the climate plan. I guess it, it falls into the first uh, pillar in terms of environmental justice, and the last one with protecting land and water. So number one, we need funding to address our failing sewer infrastructure. No one likes to talk about sewers, but they're critical to our quality of life. Um, our sewer infrastructure is failing throughout the region and we need to make it a priority to fix it, not just expand it. We're at capacity and full of leaks, yet we're on a race to add more to the system upstream. Low income brown and black communities are bearing the brunt of stinky sewer overflows in the older downstream end of our rivers where we're still dumping millions of gallons of untreated sewage. There are infrastructure solutions out there, but water departments are being allowed to wait until 2037 to address these overflows. In Detroit, in the largest urban park in the state, Rouge Park, residents must contend with condoms and feces in a river they should be able to canoe and kayak in and even swim in. But who cares about Detroit? Addressing sewer failures and uncontrolled combined sewer overflows in the next five, not 14 years needs to be a number one priority. And barriers to implementing this include a lack of making it a priority, lack of funding and lack of care for overburdened EJ communities. 
Number two, we need to protect the remaining open land that we have in Southeast Michigan and require any new development to cover the cost of new sewage infrastructure at the site, as well as its effect on overburdened downstream communities. We're developing land eight times faster than our population is growing, and that's an old statistic. Our rivers can't accommodate the additional flows from all these added impervious surfaces. We need to preserve our fields, forests, wetlands, and the downstream BIPOC communities bear the brunt of the development upstream. And I know I'm just about out of time, but we need to stop the constant development of the land at the edges of our watershed while abandoning the buildings and uh, in the inner city and the inner ring uh, suburbs. Um, we need, okay. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Sally, for your comment tonight. Okay, up next we have Wit, Wit Falconer, and then after Wit is Sandra Lupin. Wit, you should be able to unmute your line. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Wit Falconer. I'm with Pearl Certification, um, and I work in the um, Private and Public Partnerships Division. Um, Pearl is a third party certification services provider, and we're focused on transforming the market for high performing homes. And as a public benefit corporation, our core principles center around making the value of energy efficient features visible to homeowners, especially those in underserved communities. So our work uh, with homeowners, we've been able to certify over 180,000 homes in the US, almost 9,000 of which were in Michigan. And that experience on a one-to-one -one basis on the ground, I think uh, puts us in a position to contribute um, some expertise and some support as you develop programs for improving residential homes. Um, and so I just keep our suggestions simple and, and really appreciate the opportunity to engage. Uh, probably the, the most unique component of what we, we have added to our services in certifying homes is the ability for the upgrades to be seen and captured and connected to the real estate um, mechanisms to increase property values. So it doesn't just stop at improving the cost to own the home and operate it. It actually captures all of those upgrades, evaluates them, integrates with MLS and appraisal institute documentation so that property values actually increase. Um, so that's really our suggestions. One, practically speaking, to send in your program designs and then two, capture the full value of every upgrade immediately in order to stimulate the market transformation. So centering the homeowner is, is so important because this is complicated and this work can be very confusing. And, and if you don't reduce those barriers to entry and that risk, um, you, the program will, will, will languish. Um, we address the... Um, We address this barrier um, by providing a very clear roadmap from the very beginning um, in terms of how homeowners can navigate the entire prior, the process, the prioritization and the incentives. Um, but there's a lot of strategies to do that. And my main message is that we're staying ready to help your team as you come up with the practical solutions. And again, the second component of creating added value for the home by connecting to the real estate uh, mechanisms. So thank you so much for the opportunity to comment today. Okay, thank you, Whit, for your comment. Uh, next up, we have Sarah Lupin, and then Chris Vaughn is after, or I'm sorry, it's Sandra Lupin, and then Chris Vaughn is after Sandra. So Sandra, you can go ahead. Thanks, Jim. Hi, Corey. Hi, Eagle team. I'm Sandra Lupian, and I'm the director of Mass Timber at MSU. That's a program at Michigan State University that's working in collaboration with a lot of partners, including state agencies like DNR and MDARD and others, to advance sustainable mass timber construction and manufacture in Michigan, as well as throughout the Great Lakes region. Uh, mass timber is an umbrella term for a variety of very large engineered wood building construction materials that we can use in large buildings, commercial buildings, institutional buildings, multifamily dwellings, etc. 
instead of or in combination with steel or concrete to build buildings that have a reduced carbon footprint and that actually store carbon because wood is 50% carbon by dry weight and wood building construction materials store that carbon in the building for the lifetime of the building. Um, because of this, mass timber is mentioned three times in the My Healthy Climate Plan as a tool in the state's toolkit to achieve net zero carbon by 2050. But a lot of the um, approaches in the My Healthy Climate Plan are focused on important priorities like transportation, um, uh, water quality, air quality, and in buildings on operational carbon. I think those are all super critical and I understand why there's the emphasis. And we also need when implementing the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan to focus on the building materials associated with, um, with our carbon footprint of our built environments, right? So 28% of the building and construction industry greenhouse gas emissions, sorry, 28% of greenhouse gas emissions is attributable to operational carbon in buildings. 11% is attributable to building materials. So that's the part of the, the carbon footprint equation that I'm talking about addressing here. Some recommendations, love to see a uh, grant program like a mass timber catalyst program or some sort of uh, tax incentives like tax credits or rebates to help remove the green associated with building with mass timber. Obviously all new green technologies have some sort of green premium associated with them and supportive policies like grants and incentives can help remove them. Manufacturing mass timber in Michigan close to where it's gonna go into buildings just increases all of those carbon and sustainability and climate benefits. So we'd love to see some funding uh, for support of getting mass timber manufacture online in Michigan. And I think there's a lot that local governments can do to create environments that are uh, smoother for mass timber adopters. So it would be helpful for the state to take a leadership role in funding the design and analysis of model ordinances that could help support the adoption of mass timber and other lower net, uh, lower carbon building materials. With that, I'd just like to say thanks so much for the opportunity to comment and we're here to support efforts to implement the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sandra, for your comment tonight. Uh, just to give everybody an update, since we're about uh, just over half an hour in here, uh, we've got about 66 people on the line, and I've got 10 people with their hands raised to make comments. If you want to get in line to make a comment, just go ahead and raise your hand. All right, next up for comment is Chris Vaughn, and then after Chris is Adam Schaller. Or Schaller. Go ahead, Chris. Hello. My name is Chris Vaughn. I live in Wakefield in Gogebic County of Western UP. I'm the founder of protecttheporkies.com. Reducing Michigan's emissions is a laudable goal, not just for the sake of the climate, but for the impact of fossil fuels on air and water quality and the health of ecosystems. Moving forward, we must not succumb to a tunnel vision focused exclusively on CO2 emissions at the cost of all other factors. Many alternative energy technologies require vast quantities of copper which will necessitate the expansion of mining. This raises a conflict. On the one hand, environmentalists want to build alt energy infrastructure. On the other hand, mining is an industry with a tricky track record, say the least, even when it complies with environmental regulations. An independent study in 2012 examined 14 operating copper sulfide mines responsible for 89% of US production. The study found that 92% failed to control mine seepage and 100% experienced spills in 2012. To quote the Wisconsin Sierra Club, these are some of the largest mining companies in the world working under American regulations, and yet they all failed. We must recognize that when it comes to sulfide mining, contamination is not the exception, it's the rule. Therefore, moving forward, we must take extra care to ensure that sulfide mines are not developed in ecologically sensitive areas. Currently, in my own county of Gogebic, Eagle is permitting the Copperwood mine under development by a Canadian company. Copperwood would be the closest sulfide mine to Lake Superior in history. It would store 50 million tons of mine waste in a 323 acre tailings facility on topography sloping towards the big lake. We should all familiarize ourselves with the Mount Pauly mine in British Columbia. It was designed and operated by experts at the top of the field in Canada, and it too complied with environmental regulations but the dam still burst. And when it did, it crippled not just the ecology, but a thriving outdoor recreation economy. 
Sometimes environmental regulations are not enough. Even in the best of hands, things can go wrong. This is why a sensible location is crucial. Copperwood would also be next door to Porcupine Mountain's Wilderness, the largest old growth in the Midwest, as well as the North Country Trail, which was just recognized by the National Park Service. Regardless of how one feels about mining, most folks will agree this is a less than ideal location. Most importantly, as we come to live on a hotter, drier planet, fresh water will take on ever greater value. Lake Superior is 10% of the world's surface fresh water. It's the most important resource, not just in Michigan, but arguably the entire continent. There's a strong case to be made that it is neither healthy, clean, nor green to put 50 million tons of heavy metal laden, sulfide bearing mine waste in unprecedented proximity to the largest freshwater lake on earth. Minerals are necessary for industrial civilization, but location is not irrelevant. Thank you for your time. All right, thanks, Chris. Okay, up next is Adam Schaller. Then after Adam will be Joe Sabol or Sabol. Adam, go ahead. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Adam Schaller with Lakeshore Diecast, a for-profit aluminum and zinc foundry located in southwestern Michigan. Um, a couple of things that I'd like to mention first is just some of the uh, money that Eagle has already has out there for small manufacturers, uh, programs that have already worked well, and I think that would pair well with funding in the future. The Industry 4.0 grant that you guys uh, put together, and also the um, energy efficiency program that is out there right now. Uh, some other things that I think would help with manufacturing decarbonization is some sort of better uh, net metering than what is already in the law. Um, I'm not sure how best to direct funds in that direction, but I can tell you right now for industrial decarbonization, the fact that we can't trade uh, electricity kilowatts per kilowatts really limits our ability to use excess power that we generate to offset other carbon intensive uh, processes like metal melting uh, at foundries and uh, manufacturers that use a lot of heat. Um, as for implementation, um, I think making the aid simple and direct as through the programs I previously mentioned um, is really a good way to build community around some of this funding. Um, I think using people who are already in communities to build a larger team will help garner support from maybe different camps that wouldn't have been on board with climate action before. Um, I think if we look at the legislation that just passed at the state level, all of it got voted straight down party lines. And I think when we're looking at implementing the funding here, if we can get a broader group and affect more people, um, for-profit companies, other people who you know aren't necessarily in this really as climate focused, uh, I think that would really help as well. Uh, for projects that I think are pretty low hanging fruit for the state, um, solar at schools, solar at wastewater treatment plants, and solar at landfills, because the zoning is already kind of at the state level. Uh, it, some of the bills that just got passed were for large scale uh, solar zoning. So if you do the zoning uh, for things that are already kind of regulated at the state, it should make the process easier. Um, they're really good projects too for getting the community together around them. Um, so those are my recommendations. All right, Adam, thanks for your comments. Okay, up next is Joe Sable and then Robert Parrish. So Joe, I'm meeting your line. You can go ahead. Hi. Hi, thank, thanks for taking my comments. My name is Joe Sable, and I'm calling from Marquette, uh, Michigan today. I represent a lot of organizations and affiliations, but I'm only speaking for myself. Um, I will uh, point out that uh, one of the major factors we always need to keep in mind is that we need to internalize the environmental uh, cost that we're, we, we have. The, um, uh, in a nutshell, the energy that we use should cost three or four times as much as what we're paying for it right now because we have a number of environmental 
uh, issues, uh, storms, wildfires uh, that we're going to have to pay for. And the driving force for the um, environmental damage of the climate, the weather, wildfires, and so forth is the increased um, uh, temperature of the atmosphere, primarily from carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. There's a lot of focus on carbon dioxide, and um, I think uh, capturing that is probably a fool's errand unless you can do it right at the stack. So I would encourage Eagle to start with some programs to capture CO2 emission directly from power plant emission and other uh, paper mills and other large uh, producers of that. The goals that you have for 2030 and 2050 and so forth, they're so far out and who knows if we're ever gonna meet them. We've already blown past the 2015 Paris Accord uh, put forth by the uh, Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and um, um, now we have the uh, Committee of Parties 28, COP28, that just gave recommendations. Uh, they, they do have an inference of keeping hydrocarbons underground, and I would support that. Uh, we have plenty of carbon on the surface of the, of the earth. We don't need to take any more from underground. Uh, however, there's going to be a transition. It's not going to happen overnight. The one thing that we can make a difference on, I think, is methane. Uh, it is the second most um, uh, contributor to the greenhouse gas uh, uh, radiative forcing of the atmosphere. Um, the, the saving grace of methane is its atmospheric half-life is about 10 years, where carbon, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide are both about 100 years. So if we can reduce the amount of methane going into the atmosphere quickly, then I think we might be able to turn around and save a few tenths of a degree off the uh, climate budget. How can we do that? Perhaps a carbon tax on methane, um, and that puts a, a disadvantage of people who have to buy the fuel, but maybe Michigan could uh, in, institute a carbon dividend program for methane. Um, and also I would encourage uh, two things quickly, methanotropes, uh, bacteria that can absorb methane, and there is efforts to grow methanotropes in mines underground. And the final thing is we need solar hot water. We don't need to burn fuel to heat water for swimming pools. Uh, all swimming pools should have, uh, at YMCA hotels and so forth, should have solar hot water heat. Thank you very much for, your, for, for the time. Okay, thanks, Joel. All right, up next is Robert Parrish. Then after Robert is Peter Sanderson. Go ahead, Robert. Okay, thank you. My name is Robert Parrish. I'm the Vice President of the Cass County Parks and Recreation Department, and we oversee Dr. Lawless International Dark Sky Park. And one thing I would like to see this symposium address is light pollution. Light pollution is nothing more than wasted light, which means you have to waste electricity to create that light. And from a health standpoint, the American Medical Association has come out with empirical evidence that shows overexposure to light pollution can lead to a variety of uh, medical conditions, including prostate and breast cancer. And um, it also ruins the beauty of Michigan's night sky. That's uh, dear to my heart. Uh, it is important to note that uh, LED lighting is by far the most efficient lighting currently available. But according to the AMA, once again, uh, the best LED lighting to implement at your particular place would be lighting with a color temperature of 3000 Kelvin or less. Otherwise, um, you're exposing yourself to those same medical conditions I mentioned earlier. And from an astrotourism standpoint, from a capitalist standpoint, the uh, Michigan Economic Development Corporation has noticed that uh, astrotourism is on the rise nationwide, and Michigan currently is set to take advantage of that. Right now, we have six Michigan dark sky preserves and three international dark sky parks with more on the line. I expect more in the next couple of years. So I think this is a double win. We can reduce our carbon footprint by addressing light pollution. It's as easy as turning off a light. And uh, we can also take advantage of the capitalism through astrotourism. That's my comments for tonight. I wish everybody a Merry Christmas, and I hope I pass the audition. <laughs> 
Thanks, Robert. Same to you. Okay, next up is Peter Sanderson. Then after Peter Sanderson is going to be Chang Ming Fan. So, Peter, you should be able to unmute your line. You there, Peter? I see your lines unmuted. You might need to check your audio settings next to your microphone to make sure you got the right microphone selected. How about that? There you go. All right, now we can hear you. Go ahead. Go. Bluetooth issues. All right. So, um, so I I work for Washtenaw County Parks, but I'm here just as uh, myself. Uh, and I'd like to just talk a little bit about uh, the transportation side of things. Uh, I want to obviously address, you know, large scale trucking and transportation that MDOT's dealing with is very important. Um, but I guess don't forget about the non-motorized transportation side. You know, I saw, you know, you're highlighting electric vehicles, um, but there's a lot of things that can be done in some of our denser parts of the state with uh, non-motorized infrastructure, uh, with electric bicycles, and uh, that kind of infrastructure uh, is much less expensive to build than roads and has a lot of uh, other benefits for the climate and for health and things like that too. Um, so I just wanted to make that comment. Uh, I'd also like to speak a little bit about uh, the procurement side of things. So one of one of the things I work on for the county parks is I do construction projects and buy a lot of construction services and things like that. And so if there's ways that through this plan, uh, the state could help develop incentives or provide guidance for um, procurement policies and procedures or, you know, set examples uh, where we could better uh, spend our resources when buying things at the local government level. I think that would go a long way towards supporting these goals across, uh, across the board. Uh, and then the, the last thing I wanted to mention was sort of related to the first point about transportation is, you know, transportation planning is land use planning. And I know that this is really difficult to do in Michigan uh, because we have we are a home rule state. But I personally would like to see some sort of uh, broader incentive for regional planning to occur with land use planning to encourage uh, densification where we can. Uh, that lets us protect our open spaces, protect our waterways, uh, you know, have infill development in uh, a lot of areas that are already highly disturbed so we can stop expanding our footprint. But the way that a lot of things are set up right now is there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of coordination between one township in the next and one county in the next. And so I would like to see some sort of incentives put into the program for land use planning, which drives transportation planning. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. Okay, up next, we got Chang Bing Fan. And then after that is uh, Diana. Hello. Hello. Yes, Chang Bing, go ahead. Me? Yes, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Kerry. Do you remember me? Thank you, oh. Eagle. I only have very short time because of city council meeting going started. My name is Chang Bing Fan from Ann Arbor, Saline area. My colleague, JP. And uh, we have the proposal, which is called Sol. S-A-L-T, I sent it just a moment ago, just in case I couldn't finish what I want to say. Our company, Tiny Light World, developed special product, basically lighting displays, but can be really, really big, which is a mile high, which is high rise frame structure, mounting functions. One of the functions is harvest cloud energy. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, because I'm in a hallway, and then, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, um, I just want to get to the point. <laughs> Carbon footprint is the issue what I concern the most, because solar and windmill, all of them, renewable energy, which is great. However, 
what is the ratio of carbon footprint? Solid initiative, saline area light tower, or just L type high rise structure, just like Eiffel Tower, but much, much higher, much more light, and much more easy to build, and will accomplish nearly carbon footprint zero because it's a high rise building, no digging, no concrete, no heavy equipment, no interruption of natural resources. As a matter of fact, that creates six different kind of jobs. In this, the proposal first, which is about half years ago, and I sent it to Lisa and uh, Sarah, please review, that is not the latest. I do like to present to all of you, however, because of confidentiality and from, uh, pattern protection, all of this, I prefer to have a private meeting, but I do appreciate if I can chance to present you more and thank you so much. I want to thank President, um, what is his name? Um, Biden and Governor Whitmore and Curry and all of your leaders. This is the right thing. I talked to the city council. I talked to the Saline board, all of them. I say, we got to catch up. We are following you. We hope you can continue. This is the right things we should do. If we don't do it, other city, other state will do it. If US don't do it, China will do it. This is the high rise building we should do. Harvest the static charge energy from the cloud. Simple, just like Benjamin Franklin, 1752. Harvest that energy and put it into light and jar. We certainly can do it. Um, do I have five seconds or no? <laughs> time's about up there, Cheng Ming. Oh, do I have some minutes? Uh, it's just no, really your time's about up. Time's up. <laughs> time, oh, thank you so much. I got to go. Bye. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you for your comment tonight. And if you have additional comments, uh, like we said, go ahead and send them in the email. Thank you. Okay. Up next, uh, Diana Corpolango and then Jesse Schulte is after Diana. Diana, you can go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, um, um, if you are looking for me, if you need further information from me, you'll actually find me under the name Diana Kako, C-A-C-K-O is my last name. Um, my comments are my own tonight, but I do work for Mitsubishi Electric Train US, and I am a board member of the Southwestern Wayne Democratic Club. I have uh, two items I'd like to comment on tonight. Uh, the first is a top climate action priority. Uh, I live in the city of Belleville. <laughs> that is a man-made lake um, on the French Landing Dam. And um, if at all possible, I'd love to see eagles use some funds where possible to help preserve and maintain hydroelectric dams to support our renewable energy portfolios especially right now as renew um, as a few communities um, are currently looking um, and IOUs to reconsider their long-term licenses in favor of lower cost um, new generation alternatives. So let's protect our existing renewable energy resources and our communities. And then secondly, um, I do want to address the kind of urbanizing our homes and businesses. Right now, um, the uptick on decarbonizing buildings is growing, but if we need to hit that 2 million number, we kind of need to break down some of the barriers. And some of the biggest barriers are actually understanding operating costs as it relates to our utilities um, as we start supporting electrification. Um, and so if we could make access to easy to understand rates to support electrification economically feasible, it would be a, a great way to actually help support that decarbonization. Uh, for example, I'd like to see a prioritization on requiring the return of a simple electric heat rate um, that will um, increase um, those willing to adopt decarbonizing their homes and buildings if they know that they have a fixed electric rate uh, for using that efficient electric heating source, um, making it straightforward to estimate the cost and prevent unexpected price increases is a great way to help us decarbonize homes and businesses. Thank you so much for your time and putting this listening session on. 
Thank you, Diana. Up next, we've got Jesse Schulte and then Brett Kors. Jesse, you should be able to unmute your line. Great, thank you so much, Eagle. Um, I'm Jesse Schulte from West Michigan. Um, I work at the Kent Conservation District. I wanted to share that there are over 9 million acres of farmland in Michigan. Many farmers use equipment to till up their soil and compact it, which does not allow for good carbon storage. State-owned land that is leased and farmed could be required to enroll in proven conservation practices promoted since the Dust Bowl. Your local MDARD-funded conservation districts can help. Farmland owned by the state should require no-till in cover crops to help with storing carbon. No-till is proven to reduce fuel use and multiple benefits. A new University of Nebraska study by Andrew Havens found that 77 multi-year experimental results measuring changes to no-till with an av average carbon sequestration benefit of 0.77 metric tons of CO2 per acre per year. And they found 189 experimental results for planting cover crops with an average sequestration benefit of 0 0.76 metric tons um, per acre per year. So um, conservation districts are non-regulatory and will help continue to assist producers in adoption of conservation practices, but leased land. Farmers that are leasing state land really should be incentivized to enroll in no-till and cover crops. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jesse. Brett Kors is next, and after Brent is Denise Keel. Go ahead, Brent. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good evening, thank you. Uh, my name is Brent Coors. I'm calling this evening on behalf of Grass Lake and my fellow citizens. Uh, my wife and I have a 38 acre agroforestry, permaculture, you know, perennial polyculture uh, experiment here, I guess you'd call it. We're in the middle of our second multi year contract with the NRCS, employing a lot of those climate start smart strategies around shelter belts, alley cropping, silvopasture. Um, we built a straw bale house here. I've been a part of building a lot of straw bale houses natural building, consulted heavily, helped build the first uh, permitted hempcrete home in Chelsea, Michigan. Um, you know, my day job, I work for a construction management firm where over the last year and a half, I've been responsible for $280 million worth of planning and procurement around those mass timber projects you've heard about. So uh, I have a unique perspective on that as well. So run the gamut from large to small, uh, the climate and carbon sequestration, uh, transforming the food system are part of my lifeblood. Um, but again, I wanna talk about House Bill 5120, one of those clean energy bills everybody's so proud of. And that one in particular takes away local zoning and ordinance control for the siting of large solar projects. We've been in the middle of this here where Again, we, you know, rural residential communities like Grass Lake are going to become the new fence line communities. These bills do not, as a baseline, require smart climate things like planting of ground cover, like shelter belts or dual use agrivoltaics. That term is greenwashing for the largest corporate handout, right? Th this bill protects only 50 megawatt and larger. So for reference, that's $100 million of capital investment, 250 to 300 acres of land. So this bill protects the largest landholders and developers, while things like, I would be very interested, I met my wife when she was working for Harvest, uh, Harvest Solar selling at a farm show in central Illinois, Peoria. Um, you know, I'd love to put up five acres down here. It was a uh, an oil field before we bought this property and I could do a microgrid for the lakefront community that's downstream and protect them from the distribution line that constantly goes down in the swamp, uh, but that's illegal. So these bills have not protected small distributed generation. They have not protected, um, you know, only the biggest. So I hope the Eagle can stand to fight to make sure things like shelter belts, you know, vegetated barriers, ground covers, 
really fight against the inherent contradiction between wanting to do social justice and e economic um, justice in, in this transition. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brent. Okay, up next is, is Denise Keel and then uh, Nate Ra Berry. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Eagle, for hosting these listening sessions. So glad to be with you tonight. My name is Denise Keel, and I'm the executive director of the Michigan Climate Action Network. Our mission is to amplify, connect, and support all of you good people out there uh, on this call tonight who are working towards bold and equitable climate solutions. And I just wanted to share a couple pieces that Michigan Climate Action Network is working on that I think are wonderful opportunities to collaborate with Eagle as we all work so hard to implement uh, this great plan and the many new pieces of legislation. Uh, the first piece I wanted to share is my can now host a steering committee that is composed of the local leaders of many of the grassroots groups that are out there across the state. And we just held a steering committee in which we aligned our local priorities across the state. Um, I'm hearing a lot of common themes tonight, as I'm sure our colleagues at Eagle are. Uh, the first big piece that all of the local groups across the state are wanting to work on with us at MICAN are to support the local climate action plans. And I really hope we can find a way to incorporate those local plans into the statewide planning process with some specific focuses on more public access to charging infrastructure, our friends who have talked about greater mobility, the inclusion of things like municipal owned or uh, university owned utilities in those plannings are really important to our local groups, as well as composting. Uh, the second big pillar that all of our local groups agreed to work on in collaboration this year is building decarbonization. I've heard lots of folks talk uh, about this piece. There are a lot of missing funding and technical gaps in bridging the divide of all of those homes and all of those churches and businesses and schools uh, that need that funding to make sure that this happens. Uh, we really hope to work together to build a set of funded options for municipalities for decarbonization, as well as uh, recommending that those CRPG dollars go to things like electrification rebates, weatherization funds, um, and some navigator and technical support. Those anchor institutions in our communities like libraries and schools and hospitals can really um, utilize that funding as well as be a public demonstration site in their communities that are just so important. The second big piece I'd, I'd like to talk about, so that's sort of from our steering committee and the local groups. I see many of them are going to talk to you anyways. Uh, we also run a climate education state table, um, K through 12, as well as higher education. And I've always felt that it is just remiss that there's not a formal role for youth, students, or our schools in implementation of the My Healthy Climate Plan. Education could and should be a pillar of how this plan is communicated to the next generation. Our youth are going to be the most impacted by the climate crisis, and I hope you'll include education as an explicit strategy in implementation. Thanks so much for your time tonight. I look forward to hearing from everybody else, and uh, thanks. Have a good night. Thanks, Denise. Okay, up next is Nate Ra Bieri. Bieri. Then after that is Elizabeth Del Bueno. Go ahead, Nate. Okay, thanks for this opportunity, Eagle. Uh, my name is Nate Raubiri, he, him. I live in Grand Rapids. Uh, I work at Just Air Solutions, um, a community air monitoring company that uses localized air quality data to empower communities to advance environmental justice. Um, I'm also a leader in the Grand Rapids Climate Co Coalition, a grassroots group of 88 organizations in Greater Grand Rapids that are pushing together for strong and equitable climate action prior to prioritizing equity and climate justice. So we definitely appreciate the My Healthy Climate Plan's priorities. Um, I especially appreciate you know, wearing my Just Air hat here, uh, the attention that the plan pays to air quality. Um, indeed, air, addressing air pollution is a means of multi-solving, um, meaning with one action or investment, you yield multiple benefits according to the Multi-Solving Institute which is something I think every public agency should be keen to prioritize. And I hope the implementation phase of this plan does at every point possible. Um, improving air quality improves health. Um, if done well, it also counteracts environmental racism and the legacy of sacrifice zones. Um, while demonstrating the human benefits of decarbonizing, uh, getting rid of air pollution 
um, which kills so many people up to 9 million a year, mostly through burning fossil fuels, that it would be imperative to pursue um, reducing air pollution, even if there were no climate crisis. But of course there is. So I'd love to see projects um, in implementation phase that protect air quality, that measure pre and post um, solutions to de demonstrate the impact they have, um, and especially projects that take place in environmental justice hotspots and on the terms of frontline communities. Um, I think air quality monitoring is a powerful tool to bring clarity to and demonstrate sources and solutions alike to the public. Um, other priority solutions kind of with my community advocate hat on is, you know, decarbonizing the grid through community or public owned utilities, um, education, as um, Denise uh, uh, shared just before me, uh, community solar, multimodal transit, building decarbonization. Yeah, people need money to have cleaner air in their homes um, and tighter energy envelopes at their homes. Um, so I think that's a huge priority. Also, just want to plus one to Mike Dirk Berkowitz from Elevate on uh, decarbonizing nonprofits. Uh, other solutions, reducing waste, um, community composting has a uh, huge potential, prioritizing urban green space um, and more. Um, I guess uh, overall, I'd also would like to um, submit that I hope the implementation phase will not sleep on environmental design interventions that can help behavior change such as public dashboards that let cities and residents know where they stand and um, and uh, throw in to do what they can. This might not be appropriate in all settings. We know that climate is not solved by individual decisions, but I hope the plan engages communities with smart design that motivates adoption. Thanks for the opportunity to comment. All right, thank you, Nate, for your comment tonight. Okay, I've got... Just to give you an update, three more hands raised. So if you want to make a comment, uh, please get your hands raised and we'll get you in line here. So next person up is Elizabeth Del Bueno and then Janelle Rye. Elizabeth, you can go ahead. Yeah, great. Um, so my name is Elizabeth Del Bueno. I go by Lisa and um, I'm a retired doc and the executive director of Michigan Clinicians for Climate Action, which is a coalition of health professionals from across the state um, whose mission is to grow the climate health and equity movement in Michigan. We do that through education and advocacy. So thanks for letting me speak today, tonight. Really inspiring to hear everybody else's input. Uh, glad to be able to weigh in on the My Healthy, and I emphasize Healthy Climate Plan. Um, Micah would like to simply put, stand ready to support any efforts that center the implementation on health and equity, especially from the clinical perspective and highlighting personal clinical stories that shine a light on the human face of the climate crisis. Climate change is the biggest um, uh, health threat today, and I'm sure you're well aware of that, including uh, the Lancet calls it that, but also the biggest health opportunity Almost everything that's been suggested here tonight, today will not only reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but it will also improve human health uh, in the form of air quality and water quality. And what we can do is frame some of those health co-benefits in terms of clinical stories and use our trusted voices. So I want to stand here offering you know, the ability to mobilize health professionals in that way. I also wanna highlight one of um, our campaigns, which is uh, encouraging clinicians to advocate within their own healthcare system to institute climate smart healthcare. And that uh, consists of two legs, decarbonizing healthcare, but also improving resilience so that healthcare systems are safe haver, ha harbors, if you will, in the, form, in the face of extreme weather. The US is one of 50 countries that have committed to decarbonizing the healthcare sector um, and in the, in the spirit of first doing no harm. Uh, it's responsible for 8.5% of greenhouse gas emissions and about the same amount of air pollution uh, that uh, is responsible for the same number of premature deaths as medical error. So people on the front lines are experiencing that because US healthcare systems are not yet decarbonized. 
Uh, some of our barriers to implementation is uh, the fact that these hospital systems have just come off of COVID and the thought of investing in new energy infrastructure seems prohibitive. So collaborating with the Eagle to identify how the IRA can support some of these initiatives could be extremely helpful to our efforts to decarbonize healthcare sector and make sure that they're resilient for the in extreme weather events. So I wanted to simply highlight this campaign. Thank you for your work and just let you know that we are here as a group of uh, health professionals um, to help in any way that we can. Thank you. All right, thanks for your comments tonight. Up next is Janelle Ray, Ray and then Norma Bauer. Janelle, you can go ahead. Hi, Jim, thank you. Uh, my name is Janelle Rye. I am coming from Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm a structural engineer. I design buildings, mostly schools. I'm also a leader of the nonprofit Strong Towns Grand Rapids. My focus is on transportation and the Growing Michigan Together Council just released a report on Friday um, and they highlighted the need for public transit. And um, having lived in Germany for a year, um, and traveled around Europe extensively, um, I can speak to not only the equitability of public transportation, especially for people who can't drive, um, but also the climate benefits. Um, so 30% of all the greenhouse gases in the U.S. come from transportation. And um, that report uh, from the Growing Michigan Together Council, it emphasized a need for um, regional transit authorities. And so I would definitely like the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy to chime into that um, and to research the benefits of passenger rail and protected bicycle infrastructure and bus rapid transit. Um, transit and land use policies go hand in hand. Um, a single line of high-speed rail, for example, it can transport up to 20,000 people per hour. Um, and that's more than a 10 lane freeway and two airports combined. So there's definitely uh, benefits from a climate perspective to uh, decarbonize um, our whole transportation system. I don't think the focus should just be on electrical, electric vehicles. Um, if we talk about only scaling our transportation system by widening roads, um, we're kind of missing a point. Um, generally rail, especially like passenger rail, it respects the landscape more and it creates like, it has a smaller footprint on the land. Um, and so if you want to talk about um, like having more people come to Michigan and retaining more talent and attracting more talent, um, we kind of have to be in a position where we can fund different modes of transportation and scale our transportation system to move more people um, in a very sustainable way. I just can't emphasize enough um, how great passenger rail is. I don't work for that industry, but like Spain is doing it, France is doing it, Japan, Austria, Switzerland, Italy, Japan, Korea. Um, if they can do it, we can do it. Thank you. All right, thanks, Janelle. All right, Norma Bauer is next. Then after Norma is John Delury. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, Norma. Wonderful. Okay, I'm Norma Bauer, a citizen activist in Lansing, Michigan, and I'm embarrassed to say that I can't remember, but I may be the only person from the capital area uh, to be uh, offering comments. And that might be because we have a lot going on here. Uh, we are the capital area. Our economy sits on three different legs. One is government, the state, obviously, and counties and cities and townships and so on. And um, also the auto industry and our colleges. So um, we've got a number of them. MSU is a big one, and it's offering a lot of options to uh, push forward your initiatives. Uh, one of them is the... Um, supply chain management, because I'm probably not the only one who has 
uh, a lot of electronics that need to be recycled, but we don't have a place around here to recycle them. We do have a lot of nonprofits that are doing a lot of things. One of them is the Fledge, which is a micro business enterprise launcher. And um, another one is My Brother's Keeper through the uh, Truth, Reconciliation and Racial Healing Initiative with a, mainly a grant from uh, Kellogg Foundation. And uh, our Power of We Consortium is a group of 30 plus capital area uh, nonprofits who are what's left of what uh, something that Governor Engler started about uh, inviting a lot of agencies in. Well, the agencies have all abandoned us. So we're just the nonprofits now and we're operating on a small grant from uh, United Way of Michigan to help us with a uh, an organizer uh, who is helping us achieve a very ambitious goal uh, throughout the capital area because our city sits in parts of two other counties besides Ingham County and it gets kind of complicated and right now we're going through a city charter re uh, review because our charter is strong mayor and uh, 40 years old so we're working to try to get that there's a lot of good things going on like people operating recycle business um, but uh, we have a, a wonderful diversity here. There's immigrants coming from all over the place and they're being served by Samaritas and Catholic Social Services and the Ingham uh, Refugee uh, Resource Center. And um, there's people with disabilities and Michigan Disability Rights Coalition's uh, assistive technology project will help them get what they need. Um, we need them to uh, provide employees for business and uh, maybe studying at, at Michigan State or one of the other uh, trainings that's, that are available. And um, uh, let's see, one of my concerns is General Motors got away with abandoning a brownfield that had been polluting water, air, and soil uh, for many years. And there's uh, low-income housing right on the other side of a fence. Well, a fence doesn't <laughs> None of those things respect fences, you know, so here's little children playing outside and getting polluted. So um, I think I've already told you about the idea of making public transportation free. Uh, I hope I told you about Domicology, which is an initiative at uh, MSU, which talks about recycling plans before anything is built, before there's an excavation. Know how you're going to recycle it. Um, hey, Norma, hey, Norma, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to cut you off here. <laughs> oh, I didn't hear the one minute. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, sorry to have to cut you off. Um, but if you do have more comments, please email them to us, Norma. So um, eagle-oce at michigan.gov is our email address. And that's for anybody that's got additional comments they like to make. Um yeah, sorry, we just got a lot of people still in line going to make comments. So thank thank you for your comment. Um, next up, we've got John Deluri and then Horst Schmidt. John, you should be able to go. Great. Thanks, Jim. Hey, everybody. My name is John Deluri. I lead the Midwest for an organization called Vote Solar. And we're a national solar and climate justice advocacy organization. We're trying to make solar more accessible and inclusive. And along those lines, I'm really excited about the opportunity for the My Healthy Climate Plan and hopefully for the application for the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant to really emphasize the possibility of rooftop solar in income qualified communities. I recognize that this is already heavily incentivized through the federal solar for all competition, but I, I think we also know that only a small slice of those funds are allowed for building upgrades and deferred maintenance work. And this is from our experience at Vote Solar, one of the single greatest inhibitors to the equitable distribution of rooftop solar. The Lawrence Berkeley National Lab just released an update to their ongoing report around demographic trends for solar. And it looks like the median household income for a solar customer in Michigan is 97,000, which is about 30,000 above the, the true sort of median income uh, for a household in Michigan, which goes to show that there's plenty of work ahead to ensure that rooftop solar is equitably distributed. 
Along the way, if we were to leverage some of these funds and some of this prioritization for rooftop solar in the form of patching up roofs or improving insulation or grounding electrical wires, we're not just getting homes ready to receive all the solar savings from, from rooftop solar. We are also making homes safer, warmer, more affordable along the way. And so I would encourage some of these implementation grant funds, should we be so lucky, to head in this direction to support make ready work for rooftop solar and, and what they call behind the meter solar. And that concludes my comments. Thanks everybody for listening. All right, thanks, John. Up next is Horst Schmidt, and then after Horst is Sam Laval. Laval. You there, Horst? All right, well, good evening, and thank you for letting me speak again tonight. My name is Horst Schmidt. I'm with the Upper Peninsula Environmental Coalition. We've been uh, working for 47 years to protect the Upper Peninsula's water, land, and air. And uh, we fully support the uh, comments made by Chris Vaughn earlier about the Copperwood mine, but Copperwood is just one of one of a number of possible mines that are, are proposed for UP. And our main concern, as, as Chris has mentioned, is sulfide ore, which is almost the only type of ore that's a uh, body that's available, and it creates acid mine drainage, which in which translates into um, sulfuric acid. So we we again per, you know want to make you aware that not only do we have the current threat, but you also have the uncleaned up mess from uh, over fifty years ago in the copper country of of um, the Upper Peninsula, and that still is not being cleaned up. We have an area of concern called the uh, Torch Lake uh, area of concern, and we were. You know, are trying to get that cleaned up. So it's it, to us with with UP having approximately forty five percent of its area in some form of water, whether it's wetlands, lakes, or streams. Uh, it's so important that mining not be allowed because there's no way to stop sulfide mining once it is opened to the air and to the water. And it's so so crucial that we not destroy our economy and our environment in order to meet uh, today's needs. We need to look at all, all aspects of it. We need mining reform in order to make sure that uh, the mining companies actually follow the rules that they're supposed to, and so that we have the ability to keep our lands open and free, because at this point, uh, we, we are seeing more and more people coming up here to provide us with the uh, necessary um, economic benefits of tourism. And tourism is, um, you know, provides over $10 billion uh, statewide versus approximately a billion dollars for mining. So um, do we want to destroy it? So when, when we're looking at mining in the UP in order to electrify, we have to start balancing it and realize we only have one earth and we can't uh, continue to uh, do what we what our ancestors did in the past. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Horst. Okay, next up is Sam L Lovell and then Sasakia Van Wolfren. Go ahead, Sam. Hello. <clears throat> yes, yeah, I'm Sam Lovell, a uh, landscape architect that's been uh, practicing in uh, Michigan for over 35 years uh, around the state and mostly in um, environmental issues. Um, and I just have to uh, jump in about what a great thing that Eagle is doing with um, the whole uh, Michigan Climate Action Plan and what uh, what I first heard about uh, when Sally Petrella started talking about all the things that are going on with the Rouge River. I mean, this just happens 
one after another from every speaker. So um, it's it's really that we're all talking about the same thing. And or all I really want to say is that Eagle somehow has to get the message out to everybody. We're talking to a small circle here. We need to be talking to everybody. And I'm so tired of looking at Facebook and the derogatory remarks about what's going on with, you know, uh, our, our the people that don't even believe that there's a problem with climate. So how can we, how can you guys and us, how can all of us get this message broadcast to a, a wider community of people here in Michigan. That's that's really it. That's really all I have to say. We that we need to we need to get it to more than just our little circle here. And thanks for listening. All right. Thanks, Sam. Okay, my last hand up tonight right now is Saskia Van Wolfren. Um, so if you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand. Okay. Saskia, go ahead. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. So my name is Saskia Van Wolfren. Um, I'm just an um, individual um, gardener. Um, I live here in Benzie County. I'm really excited to see what's happening with the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan. And, um, um, thank you for, for working on this and, and for hosting this call. Um, so as a gardener, I just want to highlight composting as one of many climate solutions that um, one of many that need to work together. Um, my hope is that as part of this planning, we can allocate funding so that we can compost all organic matter in my county and every Michigan county. Um, so as we design these community composting systems and maybe county level composting projects, I hope that the funding would then go to the most climate friendly solution, which I think is aerobic composting. So aerobic composting produces valuable compost that residents can then use to improve their soil. And healthy soil holds more carbon um, and reduces runoff, um, helps prevent flooding and hosts of benefits. So I hope we can allocate funding for every Michigan county or smaller organizations to develop aerobic composting facilities so that we can produce compost locally and put it back into our local soils. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comment tonight. And that's all the hands I have raised. So I'm gonna give it a couple more seconds to see if anybody else wants to make a comment tonight. We're doing that. Just want to remind you that if you didn't feel like you wanted to make a verbal comment tonight, that is okay. Uh, you can also email your comment to us at eagle, E G L E O C E, at michigan.gov. All right. I'm not seeing any more hands. And uh, I want to thank everybody for being so respectful of the time of everybody else and providing some excellent comments. I'm going to turn over back over to Corey because I think Corey has got a few more slides he wants to go before we wrap it up tonight. So, Corey, if you want to share your screen again, go ahead. Okay, Corey, you're muted. Just let you know that. Classic. Um, <laughs> I usually avoid it. I avoid it pretty often, uh, the, the whole muting thing, or I see it before it happens. But thanks for, for bearing with me. Um, this is the main thing. We just want to make sure that folks uh, know how to stay engaged um, as we move forward with this process and as we continue to engage around the, the implementation of the My Healthy Climate Plan for this particular opportunity, the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program, and more broadly. So, um, we again, we have our call for projects. Forum closes December twentieth. 
Um, we've got a webinar online that you can take a look at. We've got frequently asked questions. And if you have other questions, you can always email us. Or if you have comments that don't seem to fit into that call for projects form, um, just send them to eagle-oce at michigan.gov. Um, and with that, I think that's everything I've got. Um, and we can go ahead and close it out, Jim. All right. Thanks, Corey. Thanks to the team here and to Lisa and Jennifer behind the scenes helping us out. Uh, we will be following up with everyone who registered with a follow-up email. You'll be getting that soon from Lisa, I believe, with um, links to some of the information that we just shared today. So thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. And hope you have a, a great rest of your evening and a great holiday. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.